Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the Professor, and this is the Moment of Truth. And now, the Friday Crime Report. This crime report is not so much about the crime as it is the punishment. As many of you know, headlines have been made this week because Natalie Holloway's killer, Joran Vandersloot, confessed to murdering her this week. Actually, this is not the first time that he's confessed to it. For the younger listeners, you probably don't remember the 2005 disappearance of Natalie Holloway, but for most of us, we can tell you there was wall-to-wall coverage of it nonstop when it happened, and truth be told, it went on for several weeks afterwards. The coverage of her disappearance became obscene with how the white media obsessed over it, so much so that the media's orgy of coverage became nicknamed the Missing White Woman of the Week, due to how often the white media would bounce from one missing white woman to the next. Now, to summarize, Natalie Holloway was an 18-year-old from Mountain Brook, Alabama. She came from a well-to-do family. She had just graduated from high school, and to celebrate, she and her friends decided to go to Aruba for a senior party. Aruba is a small island off the northern coast of South America, and it's controlled by the Dutch. On May 30th, 2005, Natalie Holloway went to a nightclub with her friends. She was last seen leaving the club with a young white man who was accompanied by two Southeast Asian-looking males. Enter Joran Vandersloot. Joran was born in the Netherlands in the city of Arnhem. He came from an upper-middle-class family, and when he was 10 years old, they moved to Aruba. The one thing that people said about Joran was that he lied. A lot. His mother and a former girlfriend both attested to that. The morning after Natalie left with Euron and his friends, she was supposed to have gone back to Alabama, but she didn't make her flight, and no one would ever see her again. The disappearance of Holloway triggered a massive air and sea search in Aruba that included the Dutch Army, FBI, and hundreds of volunteers. Again, most of those listening remember how all-consuming this story became for the white media, but for those who don't remember it, it's hard to put into words how obsessed the white media was with this story. About two weeks after Natalie's disappearance, Joran was arrested. He had claimed that he took Natalie back to her hotel, but surveillance video showed that was a lie. Natalie never made it back to her hotel. Joran's story changed a number of times, but the Dutch authorities ultimately allowed him to go free. He was never even charged in connection with her disappearance. In 2008, a Dutch crime reporter got Vandersloot high on marijuana and then recorded him on video describing Holloway's death. But nothing came of that because the authorities couldn't corroborate Vandersloot's claims. In March of 2010, Joran began feeling his white privilege because he contacted Natalie's mother by email and told her that he would reveal where Natalie's corpse was and how she died in exchange for a quarter million dollars. Natalie's mother paid Vandersloot $25,000 through her attorney, but Vandersloot never told her where Natalie's remains were. The payment, however, resulted in an extortion charge in the United States against Vandersloot, but he fled Aruba before he could be arrested. May 30th, 2010. Exactly five years to the day after Natalie's disappearance, Joran would resurface, this time in Peru. And rather than laying low, instead, Vandersloot was living his best life. He decided that he was going to go and take part in a poker tournament. He wasn't alone. There was a young woman there named Stephanie Flores Ramirez. She had spent the night playing Texas Hold'em in the tournament. But she never returned home after the tournament, which was extremely unusual for her. Peruvian police found surveillance video of Stephanie at the hotel where the tournament was being held. The video showed her sitting next to Joran Vandersloot. The video also shows her entering a hotel room with Vandersloot. Three and a half hours later, around 8.45 a.m., Vandersloot left the hotel alone, carrying a backpack and a suitcase. He told the hotel staff not to bother his girl in the room. Stephanie, of course, would never come out, at least not alive. Vandersloot was most likely thinking that the woman he had just killed was a nobody, but he was wrong. Stephanie Flores Ramirez came from a prominent Peruvian family, In fact, her father, Ricardo Flores, had been a race car driver and had run for both the vice presidency and even the presidency of Peru. The police gave Ricardo immediate access to the investigation as well as everything they knew about it. When the hotel gave the police the video showing Stephanie and Joran together, the cops immediately showed it to Flores. They also gave Flores and his children Joran's name. When the Flores family googled Joran's name, they were horrified by what they found. 
Around the time the Floreses were Googling Yoran's identity, the police informed them that they had found Stephanie's corpse in the hotel room. She appeared to have been bludgeoned with a tennis racket that was found in the room. By this time, Yoran had already slipped across the border into Chile. He got there by paying a truck driver the equivalent of $525 American to take him there. But he wouldn't remain on the loose for very long. A massive all-points bulletin was issued for him, and on June 3rd, he was arrested while traveling in a rented taxi. The police found bloody clothes in his backpack. He was extradited back to Peru, and the same media circus that ensued after Natalie's disappearance began all over again. By the way, you'll notice that this man, who is believed to have killed at least two women, is not being made to wear handcuffs. On June 7th, only a few days after his arrest, Yoran confessed to murdering Flores. The reason he gave was that after he took Flores up to his hotel room, he stepped out to get some coffee and bread, but when he came back to the room, he found Flores using his laptop without his permission. It's believed that Flores used the laptop to Google who her new male friend was, and when she found out that this guy was an accused murderer, it led to some sort of argument, then a physical altercation where Yoran beat the girl savagely and strangled her to death. That same month, federal authorities in the U.S. indicted him on wire fraud and extortion charges in connection with the money he extorted from Natalie Holloway's mother. On January 12, 2012, Yoran pleaded guilty to murdering Stephanie Flores and was sentenced to 28 years in prison. But even in prison, this reprobate can't keep out of trouble. In 2021, he was sentenced to an additional 18 years in prison for trafficking cocaine into the penitentiary. Peru, however, doesn't allow anyone to spend more than 35 years in prison unless they've been given a life sentence, so Yoran will be released around 2045. Now, you're probably wondering why the Aruban authorities haven't brought murder charges. That's because in Aruba, the statute of limitations for murder is 12 years. So in 2017, he was no longer eligible to be charged with Natalie Holloway's murder. And since that crime occurred outside of the United States, he can't be charged in the U.S. either. This summer, Vandersloot was extradited to the U.S. to face those extortion and wire fraud charges, and a couple of days ago, he confessed to killing Natalie Holloway and extorting her mother. He also gave some gruesome details about her death, though not a location of the body. He claimed that he threw her corpse in the water. For this, he was given a 20-year sentence, which is to run concurrently with the sentence he's already serving in Peru, so basically, the sentence he got in the U.S. is simply a gesture and nothing more. The authorities in Aruba say that while the statute of limitations for the Holloway killing has passed, they consider the investigation to still be open. What's been just as disgusting as his multiple murders is how the white media still gives this guy the white privilege treatment. They refer to a man who they know is a double murderer as charming. Because when the killer is white, the white media treats them as sympathetic. It's a human interest story, not a murder story. On the other hand, if they're talking about a black person accused of killing someone, they don't call them charming or talk about how well they did at work or how people liked and respected them or how bright and hopeful their future was. Instead, the white media says they're troubled, dangerous, suspicious. That's the kind of wording they use. Also, nobody in the white media has tried to dirty up the victims, not Natalie or Stephanie. Nobody's tried to say that somehow they had something in their past that was disparaging or anything like that. No attempts to scandalize them. No attempts to try to make them into anything other than the most sympathetic of victims. They don't try to justify his killing them either or say, well, he had a good reason for it somehow. None of that. And had Yoran been black, the U.S. authorities would have found something to nail him on. But the truth is, Yoran Vandersloot is a product of racial privilege. He was never told no his entire life. The Aruban authorities weren't exactly giving it the old college try when they were investigating the case. So the same genetic immunity from law that we see in the U.S. also exists in Aruba too, because white supremacy is global. The only reason he's in prison now is because he went to a country where his white privilege wasn't quite so ironclad. And also, worse than that, he messed with the wrong family's daughter, and they had enough influence to make sure that he would be pursued, arrested, tried, and convicted. The Arubans could have done the same, but maintaining the system of racial perks was more important to them than justice. The white media's fixation on missing white women is their way of saying that only white lives matter. A white woman goes missing, that's big news. Everyone needs to drop what they're doing and focus on this. On the other hand, when a black woman goes missing, that's not even a footnote. 
The society and the media keep perpetuating a social climate that conditions the Euron Vandersloots to think that their behavior is never really as bad as it is. There's always some sympathy from the white media or from the government, so it can't be that bad, right? Everyone knew he murdered Natalie Holloway, but he was allowed to skip town and go on with his life as if nothing had happened. If the white media treated him the way they did O.J. Simpson, he would never have made it to Peru. The statute of limitations certainly wouldn't have been allowed to expire without him being charged with something. So, after all these years, the only thing we've learned is that while Natalie Holloway went missing in 2005, thanks to white supremacy's global racial order, justice and truth went missing far earlier than that. And that's this week's Friday Crime Report. Keep your eyes open and stay on alert, because there's a lot worse criminals out there than the ones the white corporate media chooses to show you. Good day, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Dondi Waddell, Michael Clark, Aaron Kennedy, Lebon Gurhan, and Dia Williams. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black empowerment only exists because of you.